The Red Wedding might just be the single most defining moment of A Song of Ice and Fire so far. This singular event massively shifts the status quo and sends shockwaves to the larger narrative that are felt throughout A Feast for Crows, A Dance with Dragons, and perhaps even The Winds of Winter. The television adaptation of this single scene became one of the largest cultural moments of the 2010s, and for that it will likely be remembered by the North and by those in our world for decades to come. Unfortunately, as is the case of most of the television show, David and Dan really didn't stick the landing well regarding the comeuppance of those who perpetuated this breaking of guest right. Sure, Arya killed all the phrase, but in a way that pales in comparison to what might happen in the original story. Today I'm going to be theorizing about what many fans have referred to as the Red Wedding 2.0, an upcoming event in Winds that may see vengeance and justice delivered to House Frey. However, this is a pretty big topic, so I brought in a ringer to help me out. Say hi to Fantasy Haven, everybody. Hey, Quinn. Thanks for having me. For those who don't know me, my channel is Fantasy Haven, your home for all things fantasy. Mostly A Song of Ice and Fire and House of the Dragon, but there's going to be even more stuff on the horizon. But for now, I can't wait to talk about the future of everybody's most hated house. Hey Quinn. This video is actually one part of a larger whole. Over on Fantasy's channel, we did a video on the history of House Frey up to and through the main series of Song of Ice and Fire. Be sure to check that out for a refresher. It'll be linked in the cards and in the description. With all of that covered, it's time to analyze the second Red Wedding. To start, let's examine how things have gone for the Freys since the Red Wedding and how that might relate to the future of their story. Both Jamie and Brienne travel the Riverlands throughout Feast and Dance, and the Freys' homeland gives a good degree of insight into their status overall. As a payment for their betrayal of the Starks, the Freys are granted marriages with two Lannisters. Lancel Lannister wed Amari Frey, and however, this marriage is generally quite fruitless. Lancel forsakes all of his vows and holdings in order to join the Faith Militant, which results in the Freys being down one important marriage alliance to the Lannisters. Fortunately for the Freys, another marriage candidate has just arrived in the Riverlands. Jaime's cousin, Davin Lannister, has been betrothed to a Frey, and this wedding is yet to happen. It seems likely the Freys are advancing this marriage rapidly, as they've recently been burned by Lancel spurning his vows and abandoning that marriage. However, marriage is not the only reward awaiting House Frey. Lord Walder's second son, Emmon Frey, is granted River Run as a reward for the Red Wedding. Unfortunately, this reward is also out of the Freys' grasp for most of Feast. The remaining Tully forces, led by the Blackfish, continue to hold River Run following the young wolf's death. The Freys and Lannisters spend most of Feast besieging the castle, in the hopes of finally attaining one of their rewards for victory. Jaime Lannister ends up lifting the siege by emulating his father's tactics, but in the process of doing so, he puts the phrase in their place. He reminds Emmon that, despite the fact that he's the new Lord of Riverrun, he's not the liege of the River Lords. That title belongs to one Lord Peter Baelish, who has rewarded the title in the aftermath of the Battle of the Blackwater. House Frey seems to continually lose ground over the course of A Feast for Crows, in a pattern that very much continues with the Dance with Dragons. I'm going to kick it over to our guests to cover that part. And I will also note that Brienne's story is also a big deal in this, but that'll be more covered in the theory portion of this video. While Feast focuses on the Riverlands, Dance focuses on the North. Lord Frey and Lord Bolton are bound by blood. And not just the stabbing your king in the heart kind of blood. No, the Leech Lord is married to Fat Walder Frey. Thanks to their alliance, Lord Walder sends 2,000 Frey soldiers to help Roos Bolton retake the North. After all, Stannis is quite literally chilling at the wall. And Ironborn scum are still squatting in Torren Square, Deepwood Mott, and Moat Caelan. Wait, Moat Kalan? Really, George? This man's pronunciations are something else, I'm telling you. Viserys doesn't really understand the Dothraki. These troops are led by the cunning Sir Aenys, and the less than cunning Sir Hostine. Meanwhile, Simond, Rhaegar, and Sir Jared Frey take a trip to White Harbor to deliver the bones of Sir Wendell Manderley to his Lord Father. Sir Wendell was murdered at the Red Wedding by crossbowmen, and his brother Sir Wylas was captured. To secure House Manderley's loyalty to the crown, Lord Wyman's granddaughters are betrothed to Freys, Rhaegar to Winifred, and Little Walder to Wyler. To top it all off, Simon Frey has been bribing members of the Manderley household to spy on Lord Wyman and ensure his loyalty is legitimate. The Fat Lord waves his guests off to Winterfell so they can attend the wedding between Ramsay Bolton and Arya Stark. Things may be chaotic in the Riverlands, but the Freys are looking pretty good up north. Except they're not. Lord Wyman Manderley is playing them all for fools. And I'm talking moon boy levels of foolery. He's been putting on an act to secure his son's release, and now that Cersei has done so, the gloves are coming off. Simmons, Rhaegar, and Sir Jared go missing en route to Winterfell, and in a completely unrelated occurrence, Wyman brings three giant pies to Ramsay's wedding, and asks the bards to sing about the legend of the Rat Cook, a man who baked a prince into a pie and served it to the prince's father, only to be cursed by the gods and transformed into a giant white rat. Not for the murder itself, but for breaking the ancient custom of guest right. Sir Aenys Frey himself is served a slice. Could he be eating his own son, Rhaegar? 
Before they go missing, Lord Manderley grants his guests a palfrey each, and according to custom, giving departing guests a gift represents the end of guest right. So if the Frey Pie theory is true, why am innocent a hypocrite? He's just a, you know, complete and utter cannibalistic lunatic. But he's not the only one with a grudge. Although a blizzard has descended upon the land, Winterfell becomes a boiling cauldron of tension. The Umbers, Dustins, Flints, Locks, and others are of dubious loyalty. You see, the Northmen utterly despised the Freys. They broke guest right, they betrayed the King of the North, and many of their family were brutally slain. They also despised the Boltons, which is why Ramsay is marrying Arya Stark to secure his position as Lord of Winterfell. Except it's not the real Arya, it's Jane Poole, Sansa's childhood friend who was taken into custody by Littlefinger after Ned's failed coup, and taken to his brothels. As if things aren't tense enough, Stannis is approaching with an army of sellswords and northern clansmen, while a series of mysterious murders strike Winterfell. The latest sees the death of Little Walder Frey, so Hostein accuses Wyman of murdering his nephew, and Roose tries to solve the issue by sending both the Frey and Manderley forces outside the castle to fight Stannis, which probably won't go well for the Freys. In a Winds of Winter sample chapter, we learn that Sir Aenys has quite literally fallen into an upper trap and broken his neck, leaving Sir Hostein in charge, or as Stannis cleverly calls him, so stupid. Check out Quinn's Nightlamp Theory video if you want to learn more about the upcoming Battle of Ice. So, the Riverlands hate them, the North hate them, and Water Frey's alliance with Roose Bolton has turned out to be a bad gamble. Let's pass it back to Quinn. While now that we've covered the basics of the Frey's recent history, let's dive into theories regarding the future of this house going into the Winds of Winter and A Dream of Spring. First and foremost, a way in which the Frey's most meaningful action in the story so far, the Red Wedding, may have doomed a wedding of their own. So who exactly would be attacking this Lannister Frey wedding? This is directly hinted at in Brienne's final chapter in Feast. In this chapter, she's taken in by the Brotherhood Without Banners, now being led by Lady Stoneheart, Catelyn Stark revived from the grave by Beric Dondarrion and fueled by pure vengeance. She makes no secret of her burning hatred for both the Freys and the Lannisters to Brienne, and she even tries to hang Brienne for following the orders of Jaime Lannister and bearing his sword, Oathbringer. Oathkeeper, I've been reading too much Sanderson. In fact, our introduction to Stoneheart in the epilogue of A Storm of Swords takes place from the point of view of a Frey, who he himself is hanged at the end of the chapter. That being said, it doesn't seem likely that Stoneheart will be attacking the wedding personally. She was no warrior in life, and if her appearance is any indication, death might have made her body even more frail. Rather, it seems as though the Brotherhood will be attacking this wedding in Stoneheart's stead. To quote a member of the Brotherhood during Brienne's final chapter of A Feast for Crows, she wants to feed the crows like they did at the Red Wedding. Freys and Boltons, aye, we'll give her those, as many as she likes. All that she asks from you is Jamie Lannister. This is a very good indication that the Brotherhood is planning something, and Stoneheart being their commander could greatly aid them in attacking the upcoming wedding. The Freys, specifically the branch into which Davin seems to be marrying, has just taken River Run from Tully forces. Being inside a castle is typically an advantage, however in this case it could be the Freys' downfall. Riverrun is a unique castle, and as the name implies, it's situated on a river. Catelyn Tully was raised in Riverrun and would have intimate knowledge of the methods of getting in and out of this castle. There are a number of gates around the castle connecting directly to the waterways, and these could be utilized by a small force in the event of an attack. These methods could very much be passed on to the Brotherhood, or they could hatch another plan of entry entirely. At the end of Dance, Jaime Lannister is being lured into Stoneheart's clutches by Brienne of Tarth. Once he's been captured by Stoneheart, which in itself could be an interesting parallel to the second book in the series, there are a number of possible ways this interaction could go. She could kill him straight away, but I don't think that would really make sense for Jamie's overall arc, which very much seems to still be in progress. Instead, she may make use of Jamie for some other purpose. The Brotherhood has spent a sizable amount of time killing Lannister and Frey forces in the Riverlands. If they capture Jamie, the Brotherhood could utilize the status of their newfound Lannister prisoner. Perhaps Jaime would attend, I'm doing air quotes but you can't see them, this wedding, accompanied by their brotherhood disguised as Lannister and Frey forces. That way, we'd even have a point of view in the middle of the action, giving the viewer a front row seat at the horror and vengeance, as well as creating an interesting situation for Jaime to navigate, given his greatly diminished combat prowess. It's also worth noting that Walder Frey himself will likely be at this wedding. He's remarked in the past that not attending a wedding is a massive slight, as others have done it to him, and we know he's capable of moving at least within five years of the main story, as he has gone to recent tourneys in King's Landing, as he says to Catelyn. We get foreshadowing on what could be his eventual fate in the first Duncan Egg book, actually, as he is so old that he was able to meet both Duncan Egg way back when. He was very obnoxious as a child, and Dunk specifically remarks that he is amazed that no one has kicked this four-year-old down a well yet. This could tie in to his overall fate in Riverrun, as this castle is surrounded by water, 
him and his palanquin that he would be walking in could be cast into the river and Walder Frey could drown in the castle that he spent so long attempting to attain, bringing that idea that Dunk thought of so long ago full circle with the fate of the patriarch of House Frey. But speaking of the fate of House Frey, fantasy is going to take it away with our next section of theories, going into the broader future implications of House Frey's story in The Winds of Winter and A Dream of Spring, should they ever be published. Whether a second Red Wedding happens or not, Lord Walder is not long for this world. Right now, Freys are dying like flies, which may trigger the Frey Civil War. Put on your genealogist hats, this is gonna get messy. Lord Walder's firstborn son and heir was Sir Stevron Frey. Stevron has a son by his first wife, a son and a daughter by his second wife, and a son by his third wife. He's a polite old man, trained in the importance of family values. You don't think about God, Unfortunately, he dies of suspiciously minor wounds following the Battle of Oxcross, leaving Ryman Frey as the new heir. Ryman doesn't care as much about family as his father, and neither do his three sons, Edwin Blackwater and Peter Pimple. The Freys produce a lot of sons. It's a genuine demographic crisis, if you ask me. Anyway, Ryman is later ambushed and hanged by the Brotherhood Without Banners. Edwin becomes the new heir. Simple, right? Well, not really. You see, Edwin and Blackwater despise each other, and Edwin fears his tempestuous brother will attempt to kill him. Edwin's daughter, Wilder, is technically the next in line, but there are many rumours she's one of Blackwater's bastards. If Edwin is assassinated and his brother seizes the lordship, House Frey might collapse into chaos and failure. Frey failure. Freylia. There are many potential outcomes of such a civil war. Perhaps two main factions will form, and each one will seize a different fort. I imagine many Freys would rather rally behind an adult man than a potentially illegitimate young girl, although just as many would rally against Blackwater specifically. During Merit Frey's POV in the epilogue of A Storm of Swords, he remembers his half-brother Lame Lothar Frey saying it's a good thing both men hate each other more than the rest of their house. Merit considers Lothar to be one of the most dangerous Freys. He's the steward of the twins, and one of the principal architects of the Red Wedding. Perhaps Lothar will rule as Walder's regent in opposition to his, hold on, half-great-nephew, I think. Maybe this will be the Civil War, or maybe we can go deeper. Black Walder's youngest brother Peter Pimple was hanged by the Brotherhood, and his daughter Perra is also suspected to be one of Black Walder's bastards. Damn, my man really gets around. His uncle Aegon Jinglebell was killed by Catelyn at the Red Wedding, and he had no children. So who comes next? Maegel is dead and her children are advances, and I can't see the Freys accepting another house ruling the twins. Which leads us to Walton Frey, who is alive and well. So that's sorted. Walton's the new lord. The end. Or not. House Frey is a complex family with various interests. It's time to draw upon the theories of the mad maester himself, Preston Jacobs. Feel free to check out his Frey Civil War theory video. Lord Walder's second son is Emon Frey, who was made the new Lord of Riverrun by Tywin Lannister. An act of pure kindness, and definitely not because Lord Emon happens to be married to Tywin's sister Jenna Lannister. Emon might want to press claims on the twins to expand his power, and would probably have the backing of House Lannister. Emon and Jenna have four sons, big surprise, and their eldest Sir Cleos married Jane of House Darry. He was slain by outlaws, but has two, you guessed it, sons, Tywin and Willem. Willem. Either one could press claims on the Lord of Darry through their mother's side, which could also get the support of House Lannister. Let me tell you why. Lord Walder's third wife was Amorai Craighall, who produced six children. We can call this faction the Craighall branch, the Buff branch, or the Thick branch. Their fourth son, Merritt, married Maria Darry. That was a weirdly satisfying sentence. Their eldest daughter, Amorai, becomes the Lady of Darry and marries Lancel Lannister, creating the cadet branch, House Lannister of Darry. Except Lancel becomes faith pilled and the marriage is dissolved. So now, House Lannister would probably prefer the Lannister phrase taking Darry, instead of the Craighall phrase. Speaking of claims, Lord Walder's sixth wife was Bethany Rosby. The Rosby phrase are kind of seen as the good phrase. After all, Olivar was Rob Stark's loyal squire, and neither he nor his older brother Perwin were invited to the Red Wedding, probably because Lord Walder didn't trust them. Rosalind Frey married Edmure and is currently pregnant with his son, giving her and the Rosby branch a legitimate claim to Riverrun. So, Black Walder holds one fort as Lord, Lothar holds the other as Regent, and Walton Frey wants both as their rightful ruler. The Rosby Freys want Riverrun, which is occupied by the Lannister Freys, who themselves may want the twins and definitely want Castle Darry, which itself is occupied by the Craighall Freys. The pieces are in place for a civil war. But according to Maester Preston, a civil war isn't enough. We need a Vale invasion led by Peter Baelish. Oh, Pataya, Pataya. As well as being Lord Regent of the Vale, Littlefinger is Lord Paramount of the Riverlands. But Emon Frey mistakenly believes that he is Lord Paramount. So, to secure his power over the Riverlands, Littlefinger needs allies. First off, Riverrun. The Rosby Freys can join forces with the Vale to return Edmure Tully to the Lordship of Riverrun, with Roslyn as his wife and their child as the heir. 
Next up, the twins. Walton Frey is the son of Stevron's third wife, Marcella Wainwood, and his wife is Deanna Harding. So that's a strong connection to two Vale houses, both of which have close ties to the other by means of Sir Harold Harding, the heir to the Vale. Walton may need some help taking the twins from Blackwater and Lame Lothar. Finally, Castle Darry. The Craycall Freys want to keep control of Darry, and aiding the Vale would remove the Lannister Freys as rival contestants. This branch also has a bunch of Vale connections, including one Sandor Frey being a squire to Sir Donald Wainwood. If Sweet Robin is still alive, it makes sense for the Vale to restore his uncle Edmure as Lord of Riverrun. If he dies of <clears throat> natural causes, the new Lord Harold Harding would want to support the uncle of his new wife, Elaine Stone, or rather, Sansa Stark, whose true identity Lord Baelish plans to reveal. If he pushes for a Vale invasion of the Riverlands, supported by Vale houses and Frey branches with connections to each other, Sigma Finger could secure the support of Lord Edmure, and therefore the Riverlords, ultimately giving him control over the Riverlands through respect and alliances, instead of just a formal title, as well as control over the Vale through Sweet Robin slash Harry and the North through Sansa Stark. You know what, George? I get it now. Take your time. However the civil war goes down, it would certainly be fitting if the family, infamous for treachery and backstabbing, tears itself to pieces. Thanks for Whether having me, Quinn. Who knew talking about the depressing future of the Freys could be so much fun? Speaking of fun, if you haven't already, check out our video on the history of House Frey on the Fantasy Haven channel. If you want to build up the community by hitting subscribe, I would massively appreciate that. And if you're one of my viewers watching Quinn for the first time, give him a sub as well. See you all in the future. Thanks for having me, Quinn. Thank you all so much for watching. It's been a ton of fun talking about House Frey, a uh, ton of fun having Fantasy Haven on as well. Be sure to take a look at his channel, subscribe there, check out the video we did there together. Uh, it's been a ton of fun working with him, and we'll likely be doing more stuff in the future. I think we have an upcoming stream we're going to work on that I'm looking forward to quite a bit. We're going to be ranking Freys, since that's been the theme of these two videos. And I think it'll be a ton of fun. So yeah, thank you all for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe to this channel as well. I'd really appreciate that. And yeah, thank you all for watching. Have a nice night.